good morning everyone so last time we started talking about a totally different way of thinking about the classification problem where we do not work with the a multidimensional representation of the input, but we talk do classification and regression purely in terms of comparisons of pairs of points. Okay. So, these methods are called either exemplar based method or kernel based methods. So, we talked about uh, the kernel based methods where we are given either distance between pairs of points or a kernel which reflects the similarity between pairs of points and we have to do our decision of either assigning a discrete class label to a test example or we have to uh, assign a real value which would be like a regression problem. And then we talked about the nearest neighbor classifier. I hope you remember I do not have the scribbles that I had made last time. And then we had shown this demo of the nearest neighbor classifier. So, anytime you try to uh, think about what the nearest neighbor classifier does, think about this adage that a man is known, known by the company he keeps. So, if you find groups of examples which are similar, then whatever is the class distribution among the examples which are similar in the training set, uh, that is the class distribution that you will be predicting. How many of you? remember what nearest neighbor classifiers you do not remember. Okay, then let me just quickly present this part. So, this is the nearest neighbor classifier it is the simplest kind of classifier where you are given a training data set and the training data set uh, is uh, just uh, you know our usual input ex output pairs and you are given a distance function okay, between pairs of examples and you do not do anything during training. During test time you are given a test example x star, then you find a fixed number of neighbors say that number of neighbors that you find you will determine based on cross validation on, on something. Let us denote that number as r, r could be something like 10 ok, it is a small number. So, you find the r nearest neighbors of x star from the training data set and the nearest neighbors is as per the distance function which has been given by the user. So, you find that say the r closest examples from the training data set to this test example x star. So, this set we are calling as neighbors of x star ok, these are the closest r examples. And now, if I were to say in English how you do the nearest neighbor classification is among the neighbors of x star you just predict the fraction of examples belonging to different classes ok. And this is just saying the same thing in math form. You are just outputting the fraction of examples in the nearest neighbor set which is the neighbor x star set that belong to class k. Is that clear? And then we went over this example where we had uh, like data in two dimensions here which has two attributes x1 and x2 and we had a test example x star which was this point and uh, we looked at uh, r was equal to 3, we found the three nearest neighbors of this test example and we just outputted the fraction of those three nearest neighbors which belong to class 1 versus class 2 in the training data set. And then we saw this uh, demo of the nearest neighbor classifier. So, then we saw this demo where we showed that suppose if this is the training distribution, this is the test distribution and the decision boundaries that are created by choosing different number of nearest neighbors. Here they, so this is like using one nearest neighbor which means r is equal to 1. Then uh, these set of points you know this if the test example if it belongs to anywhere in this two dimensional space the color will be the predicted class of that test example right. And we see that this nearest neighbor classifier is very powerful you know it can create such arbitrarily complex decision boundary 
it's able to say that okay inside this region there is this re the inside this two dimensional space there is this one island where point should be classified as blue because there is one blue training point in that region okay so so on the one and but by now we know that any classifier which is very powerful also has the danger of overfitting so for the case of nearest neighbor classifiers you control overfitting by choosing r so r equal to 1 seems like really prone to overfitting so you might increase r so when you pick r equal to 2 then the decision boundary becomes smoother okay and as you increase further like suppose if you make r is equal to 5 then the decision boundary looks uh, like good like it's much more powerful than a linear classifier because the decision boundary is not a straight line suppose if you had used a logistic regression classifier then this decision boundary would be like straight line here this one now is arbitrarily complex but it's not seemed to have overfitted it allows for a few misclassification in the training data set and here also you have the standard bias variance trade off or you know the trade off between test accuracy and train accuracy. So, this is the train accuracy which will keep on um, reducing as you increase the number of neighbors that you consider. But the test accuracy if you consider very few neighbors because of overfitting in the training data that will be high initially and then it will reduce until you hit like this sweet spot. This is misclassification rate. So, we want it to be low. So, initially it is high when the R value is small and then it keeps on dropping. Okay. So, this is very simple and it is just a repeat of uh, what we had done earlier. And uh, then uh, we spoke in the class about what are the limitations of the K nearest neighbor classifier that it does not work well for very high dimensional data because as the number of dimensions increase the distance function becomes very noisy because for high dimensional data you know there is this curse of dimensionality which is known like suppose if you are measuring the Euclidean distance between two points and you have 10,000 dimensional data then almost all points start looking equally far from every other point. Okay. So, then the nearest neighbor classifier is not able to do a good job of classification. So, in order for the nearest neighbor classifier to work well, you need to come up with a meaningful distance function and because of that there has been lot of work in the machine learning literature on designing good distance functions. So, this body of work is called metric learning uh, work ok and uh, that is uh, one thing we have to handle. Uh, and then uh, the third of course, uh, disadvantage is that if you have to deploy the model on a small device let us say on your phone where you cannot afford to keep around your entire training data then uh, you know nearest neighbor classifier is not an option right because it just occupies too much storage and also running time might be a concern because you have to compute find the nearest neighbors which can be an expensive operation. But still nearest neighbor up, uh, classifiers or in general this kind of classifiers which are based on examples have a few compelling applications. One such application is few short classification. So far when we for all the classification methods that we discussed be it neural networks or the logistic regression classifier, uh, we have assumed that the set of class labels is fixed and known at the time of training. But sometimes there are application where you need to just dynamically choose a different set of class labels for different scenarios during test time and you need to decide uh, from a dynamically chosen set of class labels which uh, should be the predicted label for a test example. 
So, uh, now how do you specify that set of dynamic set of class labels? You specify that by a few examples. So, unlike a normal training where we assume that for a particular class label, you have lots of examples which have been assigned that class label. In this few short classification setting, we assume that for each class you might have like one or two, a few labeled examples. Like say you are trying to solve an image classification task, then you have let us say three labels that you are interested in. You want to know whether a particular uh, image is that of a dog, a panther or a cat. So, these are the three things that you are interested in. Okay. So, now in this setting for each of the three classes you will have only a few labeled examples. So, in few short classification you have so basically uh, classification with dynamically changing class labels. Uh, do not need to decide on the set of classes during training. So, example, so there might be a test 1 scenario where you might want to choose the set of classes could be say dog, panther and cat. Okay. And then in order to use this few short classification, you will provide some examples of dog. Say you might choose that the few, let us say few is equal to 2, then you will provide 2 examples of dog and then 2 examples of panther and 2 examples of cat. So, for each of the class labels you provide a few examples. So, another test scenario could be and now you will be given a new x star and you want to choose which of these three classes it belongs to this x star object. This is the uh, few short prompting scenario. Now with LLMs this is a very common scenario where you give a few examples of how to solve a task and now you give it a new task, a new instance on which it has to solve that task. So, this is few short classification. So, even before LLMs you know this paradigm of few short classification has been around for a long time. So, a second test scenario could be that your classes uh, are about uh, let us say different food types. So, you want to know whether the mess has served upma or whether they have served pongal. You do not know ok, maybe there are these two food classes they look similar to you and you want to know which of these two food types has been served. So, then uh, you are given you know you get from the internet some examples of images of ukma and some examples of images of pongal. And now given a new x star you have to decide whether it is upma or pongal. So, the set of class labels changes from one test scenario to another. Okay. So, in such cases the nearest neighbor classifiers are very useful because for nearest neighbor classification you do not need to do anything during training, but the default distance function that you might have chosen for say real valued data is not very good for high dimensional data that was one of the limitations we saw of nearest neighbor classifier. So, what given lots of examples of images with their correct labels there are a lot of such benchmarks can we come up with a more meaningful distance measure. Okay. So, that is the task during metric learning. So, so we have to learn the distance functions. Now, this as I told you it is a classical problem you know over the last 20 years or more many different methods have been proposed for learning distance functions. You do not have to assume some fixed Euclidean distance or anything, you can learn the distance function at the training time using labeled data. So, these methods they assume that during training you are given supervision of the following form. For pairs of example you are told whether these are similar or not similar. 
Okay. So, this is like a supervision of similarity. Sometimes supervision might be given in terms of triplets like given an example x is it more similar to x2 or to x3. Okay. So, you have supervision about similarity of things and now you have to your, your goal is to learn a distance function that brings together similar objects and keeps apart dissimilar objects. So, therefore, uh, you know your, your loss would be suppose if you are trying to compare objects x i and x j, it should try to minimize this loss. So, you want to minimize the loss. So, if y i and so, suppose one way in which people might give supervision is just the standard classification problem where every x i is associated with the class label and then you can deduce similarity based on whether their class labels are the same or different. So, this one is saying delta y i equal to y j it means that as far as as far as the class label is concerned these two objects are similar ok. If they are similar you want to minimize their distance ok and if their class labels are different then you want to maximize their distance sorry you want to yeah if they are different then you want to keep them as far apart as possible. Now earlier people were just trying to maximize the distance of far away objects of objects which are dissimilar but then that problem became very difficult to learn and people found it much more useful to change the loss function to introduce a margin. So, this is a margin which is a parameter, it is like a hyperparameter. So, when you start this learning algorithm you have to specify a margin and you want to say that all dissimilar objects have to be separated by at least this margin m. Okay. And after they are separated with this margin m, you do not care whether you pull them apart so far apart that they are in opposite poles of the earth, you do not care. Okay. So, this way the loss is bounded. Okay. So, you are saying that for similar objects you want to minimize their distance and for far away objects the loss. So, if you think about this loss, you know, so this is the loss we are talking about loss between x i comma x j where y i is not equal to y j. Now, what that says is that if the distance, so distance of course, is always greater than equal to 0. So, we will just plot the distance here. What will this loss look like? So, when the distance is 0, what is the loss? m. Okay. So, when the distance is 0, the loss is m. As you increase the distance, the loss drops, right. At what point of distance does the loss become 0? m. So, when the distance here is m, the loss has become 0. And otherwise, the loss is a linear function of distance, right. So, we can join these two points and this is the loss. Okay. So, as you learn the distance function, if the distance function puts dissimilar points very close together, then the loss will be high. But the after you have put the dissimilar objects at least you know m distance away, then the loss is 0. You do not care whether you go further than that or not. So, this particular loss function was much better it has been found practically that it learns much better than obvious loss functions like you know initially if I told you we want to bring together nearby objects and we want to push apart far away objects you might say that I want to. So, the default function might be default function might be that for nearby for similar objects I want to of course, minimize their distance. So, because I am trying to minimize this right. So, for similar objects you want to minimize distance and for dissimilar objects you want to maximize the distance. So, I might say that 
if the maximize means minus of the distance. So, I could just say that delta of y i equal to y j this distance function. So, now this is a very intuitive loss function. It says that dissimilar objects I want to maximize their distance and similar objects I want to minimize their distance. Okay. But it has been found to be not as robust as this second distance function because the optimizer might spend too much time needlessly in taking the dissimilar objects further and further and further away although it is not even required. Okay. Is that clear the motivation behind the design of this loss function and the role of the margin. So, um, so now the question is how do you represent the distance see because distance is what you are trying to learn right. So, you know even for classification when we are trying to learn uh, to predict the class label we assigned a score for every class and the score was like some kind of a linear function of the input or a neural network transformed that input to something. So, how do you think the distance function should be parameterized? So, now you have trained so many models, uh, how would you represent the distance function? So, we are trying to learn the distance function. Any ideas on how to formulate the learning problem using parameters? Hmm? But what, what will we learn? Because then it is fixed. If I give you an x i and x j, then the distance is just the Euclidean distance or the straight line distance between these two points. But we are not happy with this default distance function. We want to learn it. We want to come up with some other distance function. So, one answer is that we, we compare component wise each of the distances along each of the coordinates and we assign weights to different distances. Okay. So, this kind of a distance function it has been around for a long time it is like a weighted version of the Euclidean distance function where you assign different weights to different uh, dimensions. Okay. But uh, even that dist distance function it has been found to be not as easy to learn and uh, as I said this is uh, a topic on which uh, one can easily spend like 4 classes on uh, sort of different methods that people have come uh, have come up with to represent um, the distance function itself. But for now I will just talk about one method which has kind of currently emerged as the most uh, sort of uh, you know is sort of the mostly the winner. In particular application you might be able to come up with a better representation of distances, but this model has been found across many applications to be currently the most robust method. But remember again I want to tell you that there has been many many different methods of learning kernels or distance functions. But for now we will just talk about one method which has uh, been found to be good and this is based on using neural networks. Uh, and uh, these are you instead of using the neural network for classification you just have one feed forward network. But here you have uh, these what are these are called Siamese networks it means you have the same network applied on both the inputs. So, suppose if you are trying to find the distance between x 1 and x 2 then you use a neural network uh, on x 1 to come up with an embedding a vector representation of x 1. Similarly for x 2 ok and the parameters of both x 1 and x 2 the network that they use for coming up with an embedding the parameters are the same that is what is denoted by this w that the same parameters are used to find the embedding of x 1 and x 2 
and after you have come up with an embedding, you just do the standard Euclidean distance, but in the embedding space instead of in the raw space. Okay. So, very simple idea. Okay. So, this one what this outputs each of these, this is basically the embedding of x1 and this is the, again the embedding of x2 and you can just think of this as the norm of the difference between the two vectors which is also the Euclidean distance in the embedding space. So now, this, or this is also, uh, this is also, you can think of it as Euclidean distance in embedding space. So you come up with their distance and this distance is what is called here dw and you want to minimize this distance when y1 is equal to y2. So this one is y1 and this one is y2. If y1 and y2 belong to the same class, you want to minimize the distance. But when you again invoke this network on two other examples where their class labels are different. You do the same thing, you also calculate the distance in the same way by first computing the embedding and then doing this, but now you want to maximize the distance and for and we are not going to just plain use minimization and maximization, we will use the margin based method for imposing the loss on the far away points or the dissimilar points. So maximize the distance, so this will just be max uh, of 0 and m minus the distance between uh, the embedding of x1 minus the embedding of x2 if y1 is not equal to y2. Okay. So now you initialize uh, w randomly and then you enter the training loop. So you will so you are given the training data set. So you are given training data set of the form xi, yi. You are given a standard classification data set. Right? So now the first thing you will do is sample batch uh, of examples from D. Okay. So you will get say maybe your batch size is 32 you will select 32 uh, examples. So you will have x1, y1 up to xb, yb. This will be your like training batch. Okay. And now your uh, training loss will be, so then uh, loss of this batch with respect to w will be um, for, for all, over all, uh, I equal to 1 to B and over J equal to 1 to B, you will look at delta Yi equal to Yj, then you will look at the norm of the, so you pass this example Xi through the feed forward network, get its embedding, pass the second example get it emb get its embeddings and then you will just say w uh, t plus 1 equal to w t minus the learning rate times the gradient yes. max. Thank you. Is it clear now how the network will be trained? 
Yes. Yes. Why this? Okay. Sorry, but there is one more thing that I forgot here, which is the margin. Okay. There is no need for the square. Clear now? Okay. So then, uh, so this is how you would train the network. And uh, yes. No, no, we are minimizing the loss. We want to minimize the distance here. No, that, see, this is like ReLU. And we take subgradients for ReLU. So you can think of this one as basically the ReLU function. This is basically uh, equal to ReLU of uh, M minus GW xi minus GW xj. So now uh, this is uh, for training the metric. So this is one of the applications of uh, nearest neighbor kind of classifiers that when you have to do few short classification, then training a neural network with a softmax probability distribution over a fixed set of classes determined during training is not possible. And instead, therefore, you can learn a distance function using a neural network, which is trained in this alternative way. And uh, that can be used for few short classification with dynamically changing set of class degrees. This is one application. The second application, again, we will talk about now the regression task, where you have to given an xi output a yi, where yi is real valued. So in the class, we talked about linear regression, where given an x, we learned the weights w plus b, and we were able to match the target using least square. Instead of linear regression, you can also use a neural network, by the way, with square loss to solve a regression function. But uh, can we have, like what we did for classification, even for the regression task, can we make use of kernels? or distance functions. So yes, there has been a lot of work even in this space. And one very classical and solid method. So anytime you are in a hurry and you're like you joined a company, your boss wants you to, you know, come up with sort of a first linear, a, a, a sort of a model for regression within one hour. Okay, you can always do this. This one you can do it within 10 minutes also. There is nothing much to do. All you have to do is uh, come up with a reasonable kernel or a distance function. And then the regression model will just try to, given a training data set D, the regression function applied on X is just going over all the training examples and for each training example, you know the correct yi, you multiply that yi with the kernel or similarity of the test example x with the xi. So that is in the numerator. In the denominator, you add the total sum of similarity of this test example to all the training examples. So in other words, you know, if you have stored somewhere x1, y1, x2, y2, x and yn, this is your training data. So this is your training examples you have stored somewhere. In comes a test example, x, okay. We can also denote it as x star. So in comes a test example. So for this test example, we will compute its similarity to all the test uh, all the training examples and this similarity is just kernel values of xi with each one of them. And now this gives you the similarity of x star to all the training examples. But then you normalize this similarity and you convert each of this similarity into a weight uh, for say the ith training example, which is just the 
similarity of x of the test example to the ith training example divided by the sum of the total similarity of this test point to any of the training examples okay so now therefore each of these kernel values can be thought of as being proportional to the weight of that example right and finally the y hat that you will be predicting is just going to be the sum of the weights of each example where weight is what you have calculated here so it's sort of like nearest neighbor classifier but because it's a regression task we just take a weighted combination of the regression value attached with the training examples so here is an example of using kernel regression let's say uh, here your data is uh, one dimensional d is equal to 1 so this is just the x1 values for different x1 values you have different y values this is how we had also first demonstrated linear regression and each of these crosses is a training example okay if you had tried to fit over this crosses a linear least square fit it's going to be a very bad fit right i mean you will not you will so suppose if i try to fit a straight line it's going to have huge errors i don't even cannot even come up with some respectable line here maybe something like this okay it's going to be a very bad fit but in contrast if you apply kernel regression and let's say here the kernel is just the euclidean distance between two points then for each of this orange you know test examples which uh, sort of here you can choose an arbitrary test example you will compute the weight of all the training examples around this test examples so clearly the weight will be higher for nearby points and low for far away points right and therefore for each test point so suppose this is the test point this is the estimated value it's basically a weighted sum of the y values of nearby points because far away points will anyway have very small weight because of this property again the kernel regression is a very powerful method if you can come up with a good kernel function it can fit any shape right it can fit any distribution and like when we were fitting the list the line you know we are assuming that our data you know the x to y relationship is linear here we are not making any assumption right we just come up with a kernel and for every test example we'll just look for nearby examples and take their weighted sum and therefore we can fit arbitrarily complex function but again here we have the same problems that if the distance function is not good then the kernel regression will return very poor estimates yes no so it's the inverse of the euclidean distance so the question was is the kernel equal to the euclidean distance it's actually the negative of euclidean distance so one example kernel between xi and yj is uh, this kind of a kernel it's a uh, sort of comparing the distance between them and this is the distance you can think of between xi and xj and we take the minus of that but in order to keep it positive we take e to the power minus and we can have some weight attached to how fast we want to decay this similarity with the distance okay this is a very well known kernel it's called the rbf kernel or gaussian kernel again if you have to come up with a regression model within 10 minutes the rbf kernel is a good starting point all you have to do is choose a decent gamma okay gamma is like the r of the nearest neighbor classifier you know if you make gamma very large then 
points which are far away will not where their weight will quickly become zero and if gamma is small then you will consider more and more far away points is that point clear to everybody so let me make sure of that by asking you a question when are you more likely to overfit when gamma is small or when gamma is large gamma is small right so for example uh, if gamma is small are you more likely to overfit or when gamma is so people are saying that when gamma is small you are more likely to overfit you cannot there are only two possible answers right <laughs> So now you have to give me the reason. Yes. That's right. Yes. So uh, in fact, we should uh, say that when we use kernel regression, the weight that you assign to the jth point is basically now e to the power minus gamma of the test example x star minus uh, x j whole square divided by sum over all the training examples. Let us now call it e k e to the power minus x star minus x k whole square. Can you recognize this operation? Oops. What are we doing here? soft max right it is like applying soft max on minus of the distance right and we had motivated that soft max is like a proxy for max right so this gamma it tells you whether you are taking max or uh, top 2 or you know it is sort of it is kind of giving you a continuous uh, form of R. Okay. So, when gamma is very large because one person has to win right one of the outputs because it sums to 1 right the sum over wj has to be equal to 1 all of them cannot be 0. Okay. So, when gamma is large the j for which the distance is smallest will be the one which will get a weight of 1 and everybody else will have a weight of 0. When gamma is very small, for example, when gamma is 0, then all points have equal weight, right. It means the and then what is the y value that you will predict for a test point? So, if gamma is 0, what is the predicted y? for a test x star. Average, it is just going to be the average y from the training data set, right. So, so therefore, if gamma is equal to 0, the y hat is just equal to sum over i equal to 1 to n y divided by n, right. And if gamma tends to infinity, then what is y hat if gamma tends to infinity? Hmm? Yes, the y of the nearest example, right. So then it will be the y um, i star, where i star is the nearest example to x star. Okay, A any questions? So, uh, the question is if it is multivariable, then is gamma different for different variables? If you want to learn a more complicated distance function, then for different variables you can have different weights. So, here by default we are assuming that there is just one weight over the entire distance. So basically this is the second application of uh, exemplar based methods. Now we will talk about a third uh, kind of application of kernels for classification uh, 
which is much more principled than the nearest neighbor classification method in the sense that it sort of gives you like the best of both worlds. It gives you the capability to, uh, to make use of kernel functions, but at the same time it allows you to uh, sort of uh, do learning uh, which assigns different weights to different kernels and it leads to much more accurate classification and such a classification method it is very well known for like a few years back it was very popular in the machine learning community. Does anyone know which classifier I might be referring to? SVMs support vector machines ok. So, we will next start with uh, a particular principled way of using kernels to design classifiers and that method is uh, going to be support vector machines. Now, when we use support vector machines, we cannot be very casual about the definition of kernels. We need to make sure that the kernel specifies, satisfies certain properties, ok. And one, so this one important property that kernels have to specify before we can get into support vector machine is that the kernel functions, so these kernels have to be special kernels, these are called Mercer's kernel functions. And these kernel functions are also defined over pairs of points and they return a real value. But we in particular require the kernel to be a symmetric function, ok. Whereas in the earlier when you design nearest neighbor classifier, the kernel function need not even be symmetric, ok. If there is some application where a asymmetric kernel makes sense to you or distance function makes sense to you, you can use that. But for SVMs, we require the kernel function to be symmetric, which means that kernel between xi, xj is equal to the kernel between xj, xi. So, this means that kernel of xi, xj is equal to kernel of xj, xi. And for any set of n points in the training data, we should be able to come up with real values for uh, sorry and for any choice of real values ci which you can think of as weights assigned to different kernels this particular property has to hold that sum over all pairs of kernels the kernel value multiplied by these weights has to be greater than or equal to 0. This seems like a very weird property. but in linear algebra, if you think of the kernel as a matrix which is defined, so if you think of the kernel values as a matrix, so suppose if I have n training points and I create this kernel values between every pairs of example, so this is the kernel xi, xj for all pairs of examples ij. Now you will get a square matrix n by n square matrix. For Mercer's kernel there is a property that this matrix has to satisfy and that property is that the matrix has to be positive semi definite. How many of you have heard about positive semi definite uh, square matrices? Yes. So, the, mat the kernel matrix, this is called the gram matrix, the gram matrix has to be positive semi-definite and positive semi-definite basically means this. Another way to characterize positive semi-definite matrices is that of that matrix, if you were to calculate the eigenvalues, then all the eigenvalues will be greater than or equal to 0. So, so this is the property that we require for kernels. Now, it might seem like a very esoteric property and how do we make sure that whatever kernel we have designed satisfies these properties. You know in general this can be a task that whoever designs the kernel needs to fulfill. But the good news is that most of the kernels that we have been using so far already satisfy this property. 
okay so we uh, so one popular kind of kernel is the linear kernel which just compares two points based on their dot product okay so the dot product of two points if you this is called the linear kernel that already is positive semi definite if the gram matrix corresponding to the linear kernel is already positive semi definite you can generalize it to general uh, you know polynomial kernels so polynomial kernels takes the dot product of two um, uh, vectors plus 1 to the power d where d is the degree of the polynomial so this uh, is also positive semi definite and we just now talked about the radial basis function or the gaussian kernel this gaussian kernel which uh, just uh, we just talked about e to the power minus gamma of the square norm between two points that's also positive semi definite and uh, here is another kernel it's not very frequently used is a sigmoid kernel which is a sort of just tan h function applied to the dot product of two vectors Uh, plus a constant. This is also positive semi definite. Now, why do we care about kernels having this property? One of the main reasons, in fact, the main reason why this property is important, is that when a kernel satisfies this property, one then another property is valid. and that property is that the kernel has embeddings okay what does that mean that for every valid kernel um, you know which is the mercer's kernel so for any valid mercer's mercer's kernel there exists an embedding function and let's call this embedding function phi x such that the kernel value between x and x prime uh, between two pairs of points can be equal to just the dot product of the embedding of individual points okay so earlier whatever you were trying to do which required you to compare two points uh, always just bring together two points before you can compute their similarity now you can independently create embeddings for each of these points the embedding will of course be a function of the kernel different kernels will give rise to different embeddings so this embedding depends on what kernel for linear kernel the embedding is trivial it's just the original embedding because that's the definition of the linear kernel but if you have an rbf kernel what should be the embedding function okay that's what we have to decide okay but the bad news is that the embedding function could even be infinite dimensional it does not need to be a fixed dimensional embedding it just says that there exists an embedding and uh, then you can express this kernel values between the between pairs of points as just the dot product of the embeddings of these two points and this is what mercer's theorem gives us Okay. for people who already know about the definition who are very fluent with linear algebra you can almost see the proof of why this is possible that's because if you have a positive semi definite matrix you can come up with a spectral decomposition of that matrix in terms of its positive eigen values and eigen vectors and at least for fixed finite dimensional points the embeddings would correspond to in fact the orthonormal decomposition of any data in terms of the eigen values uh, now this thought which uh, sort of uh, works for finite dimensional point when you extend to arbitrary kernel function basically gives rise to this mercer's theorem so we will see an example of uh, coming up with embeddings corresponding to any kernel let's assume that we have chosen a kernel which is just uh, the dot product of two points and square so we have dropped that plus 1 it's okay you, you can even this is a valid kernel okay yes so i am going to explain it with an example now okay so let's say our kernel is this 
okay it just takes our kernel function takes two points and uh, computes their dot product and that is a real value and it returns the square of the dot product that is how we compute the similarity between two given points now corresponding to this kernel function we want to independently embed each of these points so that the dot product of these embeddings will give us the same value as what we would get through the kernel function okay so that is the definition of the embedding so we will see how we will come up with this so our goal is to i am going to claim that if this is the kernel then this kernel if i were to do the dot product of two points x1 and x2 let's assume that you have two dimensional data so the original data is has two attributes x1 x2 then the dot product of these two points is given as this value everybody with me so far yes now we take this dot product and square it up now you have to help me write the square of this value okay what is this square x1 x1 prime whole square plus x2 x2 prime whole square plus 2 of x1 x1 prime and x2 x2 prime right this is just the definition of the this thing now i am going to write this as equal to uh, x1 square dot x1 prime square plus x2 square dot x2 prime square plus uh, let's write it as this particular term i am going to write as square root of 2 x1 x2 multiplied by square root of 2 x1 prime x2 prime this one i am rewriting the same thing as this everybody okay have i done any mistake no right now from these three terms we want to come up with an embedding separately of the x and x prime so that their dot product would give us the same answer this which is this one and i am going to go backwards and claim that suppose if i choose the embedding of phi x as x1 square square root of 2 x1 x2 and x2 square similarly the embedding of x prime is going to be x1 prime the first coordinate of the x prime uh, instance then the first coordinate of the x prime uh, vector multiplied by the second coordinate of the x prime vector and the second coordinate of the x prime vector square right now if i compute the dot product phi x dot phi x prime what do i get so this now the phi x is a three dimensional vector and this is also a three dimensional vector so when i compute their pairwise you know for each of the coordinates when i compute their dot product i will be multiplying this coordinate with this one this one with this and this one with this so this is going to be equal to x1 square first coordinate square of the first point first coordinate square of the second point plus this quantity square root of 2 x1 x2 this is for the first point and then square root of 2 x1 prime x2 prime of the second point plus x2 square dot x2 prime square now these two are they the same they are right so they are the same so therefore we can claim that phi x is an embedding of this kernel so whatever you were trying to do with the kernel function 
you can now do by converting your input x into this three dimensional representation. Even before in the pre mid same portion we were talking about features right. So, this is an embedding it is again like a feature that you have extracted, but here what features you extract is determined by the kernel you do not first pick the features you first pick the kernel and for every kernel there is a unique set of features which you have to mathematically derive. For all kernels it may not even be possible to write out the embeddings in finite dimensional for example, for the RBF kernel ok. But the fact that an embedding exists is important for other things that we will be doing when we train the classifier. Yes. Yes. So, there is a one to one correspondence between embeddings and kernels. Now, once you have such a kernel again there are lots of things you can do with these more uh, principled kernels let us call them the Mercer's kernel. You can use them to design uh, you know classifiers which have better generalizability uh, which uh, are the support vector machine classifiers. You can also use them to learn feature embeddings there is this thing called kernel principal component analysis which is very powerful. Then you can use them to come up with a distribution over functions. So, this uh, is a kind of a mind bending concept it is called Gaussian processes and for people who take the advanced machine learning class we will discuss Gaussian processes, but not in this class. And uh, you can use these also to learn density functions ok, but uh, for this class we are only going to focus on support vector machines. So, now uh, for a support vector machine, so support vector machines these are classifiers and uh, uh, unlike say the logistic regression and other models these are non probabilistic classifiers ok, they have been designed just to classify points and in fact it originally they were planned, uh, designed only for binary classification tasks, but now they have been extended even for multi class classification, but we will initially consider binary classification which was uh, what they were mostly designed for uh, first. And uh, in fact we are going to assume that the class label yi is either minus 1 or plus 1 ok. We will not assign them arbitrary indices these will be specifically called minus 1 and plus 1 ok. And uh, so, now the support vector machine classifier it uh, is totally based of kernels ok. And uh, so, when you want to classify or assign a score to an example y this is their test example then its score is going to be it is sort of looking like uh, linear regress the kernel regression you will multiply uh, every training example uh, x size label correct label y i with the similarity of x with y i. But unlike in kernel regression where is there is this normalization we do not have the normalization instead we have this new parameter alpha i which you can think of as a learned weight of the ith training example in the classifier. So, alpha i unlike for nearest neighbor and all that where we were not assigning any learning we are not except you know here we have to we can learn the weight alpha i for each training example. So, these are learned. So, these are learning fixes values of alpha i and there can also be a bias term w naught like we had for normal logistic regression classifier and these alpha i's in support vector machines are chosen in a way so that only a few of the training examples have non zero alpha i values. Most of the training examples in support vector machines will have alpha i equal to 0. So, the points for which 
the alpha i is non-zero, these are called the support vectors. So the vectors are the training examples and you select a subset of the training examples to support your classifier okay? and hence the name support vector machines. And, uh, and this and the yi is finally once you have computed the value of fx for any test example the predicted class label is just the sign of fx. If fx is negative you predict minus 1 class, if fx is positive you predict plus 1 as the class. Is it clear like how do you define the support vector machine classifier? Next class we will talk about how you train a support vector machine classifier. But make sure you understand the definition of how to apply a support vector machine classifier, what do you need to learn. So in order to create an instance of a support vector machine classifier, you need to provide a training set and you need to provide a kernel function k. Then we will discuss a training procedure to learn the alpha i and w naught values. Once those are trained during deployment, you need to only keep around those training examples for which alpha i is non-zero, which means you only keep around the support vectors. So it's not as inefficient as nearest neighbor classifiers where you need to keep around all the training examples. Okay? So you keep around only the support vectors and you use them to assign labels to class to a new test example by first calculating fx and then predicting the class which corresponds to the sign of fx. Okay, so you know, so if uh, so, support vector machines. In the past, I have taught support vector machines over like three classes in its full mathematical glory, but. Uh, because uh, now in this class we have so many other new topics to cover. So I will not be able to include all the derivation and the math that we used to cover earlier. For people who are interested, you know, you can just study on your own support vector machines, the math <coughs> behind support vector machines. But uh, next class I will provide an overview and uh, you know the reference material as I said is uh, that probabilistic machine learning uh, book by Kevin Murphy. I will also post that on Moodle and that is our topic for next class. Okay.